of the growth is those that are um, actually affixed to that line. Um, as you can see in this image, it's probably due to the overgrowth and interaction of those species right now. In 2008, we began our outplanting efforts. Um, we outplanted from our pilot land screen in 2007, which is indicated by the circle on the, on the figure that's Port Edward Lake on the bottom, for those who are familiar with the area. Um, we're just, just south of that. We have planted across our inner, middle, and outer reefs within Broward County. Um, it's historically been known, and also currently, um, has populations on all, different, all three of those reefs, um, populations are recorded. We have planted on pucks, um, about 75 and 69 corals per site, and 10 different genotypes each site. And the genotypes are replicated across sites. For the first year, we looked at survival and condition of those corals monthly, and then quarterly we collected uh, individual growth measurements on every branch for the linear extension. Following that one year, we reduced our monitoring to quarterly, and then after, well, after the second year, we reduced it to annually, and we've just recently collected our eight-year um, survival data on these columns. This is our one-year data. Um, the, red, <coughs> the red picture is the inner reef, um, the green picture is the middle reef, and the blue picture is the outer reef, and you can see that there are differences in their growth forms and also we're seeing a significantly uh, higher survival of the inner reef versus the middle and outer and we see a significantly higher growth rate of the inner reef versus the middle and outer. Which we're kind of expecting, we find most of our populations on the inner reef, near shore, hard bottom, shallow area for this species. So like I said, we, we've been monitoring these now for eight years. This is the survival of just one year, that monthly growth our monthly survival. Um, you see it's really big decrease at the six month mark at that middle or outer reef site. This is probably due to an upwelling event where we see a, saw a couple week uh, decrease in temperature across all the sites of the outer reef the most. Now if we expand this across eight years, and I guess this might be the negative side of the story on this graph. Um, but what this is showing is actual survival of these colonies on their outfended material. So in this case, on the top. So at eight years, we're seeing that that inner reef actually has zero columns remaining on their outfended top. But I'll get into a better story on that in a few slides. But I first want to show you what an outfended colony might look like. So in the upper left is um, this is all the same colony at the outer reef. Um, it's a six-month-old colony. We outfended in January of that year. And you see six months later, that colony was fragmented to pieces. It recovered um, to a small colony in the upper right. That's a half meter stick in the picture in the bottom left. Then you see that it has partial mortality through, but eight years later, it's really kind of hard to see on this picture, but there actually is tissue remaining on that colony in the bottom right hand image eight years later. <laughs> so like I said, I may have a positive out of that story. So we realized that after a few years, we weren't really collecting the data um, appropriately to really show that we're having success with this outplanting. So what we're noticing is that while they're dying on our pucks, the site still has their coordinates. So are we missing something? So unfortunately, we found we didn't start this at the beginning of the project, but when we did outplant these sites, we did know that they were all in low densities, um, wild populations in low densities. In fact, the outer reef at that particular site had zero wild colonies so in 2014, uh, we began a project where we counted the number of fragments surrounding our outplant area. So our outplant area is 10 meters by 6 meters, and you can do that white box on the right side. Seven meters out from that, we swam and surveyed every dead, alive, loose, attached, colony, and estimated their size class. So this is, on the inner reef, the number of colonies that we outplanted, 75. In 2014, we only had nine colonies remaining, and then decreased to zero at the inner reef. However, when you go back and count the number of fragments at that site, knowing that we had about a half dozen colonies at the site wild, we have 72 colonies in 2014, showing that these outplanted colonies are surviving through propagation at the site. Unfortunately, we do see a decline um, in those fragments of 2016, just now 10 colonies remaining at we look at the other sites, the middle reef, we see, we see the same trend, and the outer reef, I really like this story, because we only outplanted 69 
colonies here, and after eight years, we have 25 colonies remaining at that site. And this data, we would have missed this actual propagation from these outplanted corals and this site enhancement um, through this outplanting if we didn't count, uh, count these colonies. In 2010, we were able to expand our nursery, um, and we began outplanting from those nurseries in 2012. We have since outplanted at 18 different sites, and we have 5,500 over 5,500 corals, ranging in size from 5 to 100 centimeters of total tissue. And we estimate that we've impacted about 10,000 meters squared of the reefs on Broward County. The map on the left shows you in the blue boxes the sites that we've outplanted to, and the red are the nursery locations and the circles. For all these projects within the first year, our monitoring was between one and three months. And then six and 12 months um, in, in regards to what we were required for permitting. But we also went out every two months looking at survival and condition and took a subset of the colony images um, so that we could extrapolate growth in the future. Our second year, we reduced that to quarterly images of these sites. And then subsequent years, we went annually and collected the same data. We have two different, mainly two different uh, designs for our outprinting. Um, we have what we call the grids or arrays, and this is um, one site would look like. We have three different arrays separated by 20 meters. The different colored dots are indicating genotypes, so we randomize our genotypes throughout each of those arrays. And we're looking at the habitat influence on survival and growth. We're following the changes in fish population as the complexity increases. Um, we're looking at genotype survival, condition and growth comparisons, and also we're evaluating different outcomes. There's three different outplant techniques that we're, uh, we're looking into. Uh, one was epoxy, one is using nail epoxy and a cable tie, and also using um, transplanting out of the pup, looking at the best way to outplant these corals. And we did this across four different size classes. Here I'm just showing the smallest and the largest, where the smallest size class is between 5 and 15 total centimeters of tissue, and the extra large is between 60 and 160 centimeters of tissue. Our second design is what we refer to as density, and we outplanted 25, 4, or 1 colony within a 4 meter square area, looking at the influence of predation of disease on different density populations. We'll then use this to also compare to the wild populations that we have um, throughout Florida, and what we've also been studying since 2008, and doing that different differences in um, density if we're seeing the same thing in outplanted populations that we see in the wild population. We'll also look at the fish recruitment across these different density populations, and this will also help lead to uh, what we're hoping is an optimal outline design. So, in the upper right, I'm showing you, in case I forget to mention what type of design uh, these results are from. And this is from one of our grid designs, and I refer to these as core one or four. Each of the colored lines is a different site. And what we see is the survival in 2012 through to the April of 2013. So 10 months of data. It doesn't look too promising. We had um, over 50% uh, mortality at all of these sites. If you can see on the bottom, it says post Isaac and post Sandy. Um, those are two hurricanes that went through. Didn't directly affect us, but we did have increase in, in rain and wave um, and wind um, for a significant period of time, which uh, we went out before Isaac and after and we saw that dramatic decline uh, of survival. So, due to this quick uh, mortality event, we decided to redo these outplants. So, we increased our number back to 150 colonies per site in 2013, and then we state checked these again through um, August of 2015. And we saw we had much better survival using the same world at the same site. Um, so, we could indicate here that it's not really the site that's driving the mortality, it was that those two events that drove the mortality. We went back out this summer, and um, that 2015-2016 disease event um, seems to be affecting our outfits as well. Um, we're back down, not terrible, but down to 50% of the survival. If we look at this by genotype, um, like I said with the nurseries, so these are 10 different genotypes that we outplanted um, to these four different sites, the same four sites. And what I want to show here is that we still have variability between our genotypes. We have between 30 and 65 percent survival after 10 months between genotypes. Each line um, color is a different genotype. 
Well, we redid this project in 2013 through 15. What I found interesting <coughs> is that some genotypes stayed the same at high survival, some increase in their survival across the time, and some decrease in their survival across the time. If we look at one genotype in particular, you see that it's not necessarily behaving the same. It had great survival to start with, and then dramatically decreased, had a really big impact on the form. Whereas in the second time doing the project, it remained pretty steady and then dropped off again and down to the bottom. But what's even more interesting to look at with the genotypes is their comparison to the nursery. And I'm sorry, you probably can't see those colors, but what I can tell you is that some in the nursery who do really well don't necessarily do well on their outline and vice versa. So you're not seeing this predictability in genotype survival or even conditions. So in, um, like I went through that other graph before, I'm going to do the same with these four sites. So after our three years of data, we only had 55 to 77 colonies remaining. While we were thinking ahead for this project, we ran a Beltran site to do um, community composition and see what was at the site before we outlined it. So in 2012, you can see in the bottom left, there are four dots there indicating that at each of these sites, there was an abundance of less than 50 wild columns at each of the sites. One year after all planting, we counted the number of fragments at the site, and two years after, we also counted to see an 160 to over 400 colony increase at the site alone. So while we can't say they're all directly from our outplants, we can say that increasing the abundance at these sites is even more increasing than those abundance through all planting. Um, one of our other studies looking at these size and techniques, I'm just walking through the graph, the top pictures are, are um, depicting the size of the colony, and you see the survival of those colonies by the outplant technique, epoxy on the left, the nail in the middle, and the on the right. We see with small colonies, the best chance for survival is using a nail and cable tie. And then as we go across our four different size classes, you see an increase in survival as the colony size increases, and also nail and epoxy seem to be the winners on, on the jet controls of the green growth. If we look at growth between these size classes, we see that small colonies actually have the greatest growth rates um, in tissue production as compared to the medium large and extra large. The medium large and extra large grow at approximately the same rate. There's no significant difference between those. And the technique doesn't really matter, um, except for those small colonies. They don't really like being um, transmitted on the epoxy in terms of tissue production. This is the same colony one year later. I'll plant it on a pop, uh, top versus the bottom. Now if we look at density, um, this is really trying to mimic what we see in our wild populations. We have a number of patches offshore Broward County in which we have these high density, uh, density populations. So we were trying to build them artificially through, through outplanting, and that's why we did 25 colonies for F1. Um, as many of the populations, the rebounding populations, are really in that one colony uh, population level. So the graph on the left shows percent survival, and the zero to one is from zero years to one years, and the one to two is from one to two years. And I separated the data that way to look at as density increases, what we see. So zero to one year is still kind of low density, and the one to two year we're seeing increasing density. Something surprising to me, I wasn't necessarily expecting, is the number of missing colonies. This is a picture, both of these pictures are of our high density plots um, after three years. Um, you would expect to see, hopefully see 25 colonies, they're a little bit better in the story. The top is looking good, the bottom, uh, you should see 25 colonies there, and there's about 7 colonies for me. Um, the low density are seeming to do better. Uh, still looking into the regionality behind those going missing, or what, what's happening in these really high density populations. But we also see the same trend in our wild populations, in our patches, those high density populations don't seem to survive as well. This is the condition, since we're really focused on what disease is doing and what predation are doing across these different densities. Again, zero to one year and one to two years. Especially highlighting that high density, we see an increase in the prevalence of all conditions of their density is increasing. Whereas you look at the low density, and there's just a few colonies that have predation uh, colonies, and zero disease of predation um, and low density population. So 
that was really fast. Um, and, and there's a lot more data that we have um, that was just trying to give you a, pr a pretty good overview of what, what we do in the program. Um, and the conclusions that I can draw from this is that <coughs> some of the data is important um, in terms of actually documenting such of these LCAN programs. If we strictly look at the way all these are outfended, if they're outfended out of mail or a or whatever they need, if we're solely following that colony, our outcomes may not be as successful as we're saying. Um, so these colony fragment counts are really, uh, really important in, in determining the, the success of these programs. Um, success of a genotype is not predictable. I hope I drove that home through some of those figures. And then it varies across years and even sites and some of the data that I didn't present to see some do really well one year and not well the other year. High density outcomes have a lower success rate, similar to our demographic monitoring of circuit coordinates. We've been looking at these two populations for uh, eight years now, and we're still not seeing, uh, we still see the same trend of those high density populations. We get a lot of disease, we get a lot of fragmentation, um, and predation in those sites. And in terms of outplanting suggestions, outplant should be over 15 centimeters in total linear extension. Space around one to two meters and transplanted using nail, um, a nail proxy. <coughs> and this is due to give them a higher survival, increased potential for cross fertilization, and also that decrease in prevalence, uh, a decrease in disease prevalence. There's a lot of people to thank in this talk. Um, this is a big nursery collaboration throughout Southeast Florida, including University of Miami, the Nature Conservancy, NOAA, FWC, Mount Marine Lab. Um, we've all worked together for a number of years and have bounced ideas off each other, and it's been a really great collaboration. A lot of people in the Port Restoration and Monitoring Lab um, we work together to collect all this data and all plant these thousands of corals um, across the reef. And then, of course, our funding agencies, Lauderdale by the Sea, NOAA, we had an ARA grant, um, TNC, um, and we started the Coral Nursery Initiative, which is also helpful. Not because I think it should be the opposite, but 
basically that's my question there. I mean, is it something that should tell us that you know genotypes are not a good indicator of colonies we should use for restoration, or for their specific responses, whatever is going on with in those. No, yeah. yeah, so the, the genotyping was done through microsatellite. Um, there may be other indicators such as what symbionts these corals are hosting and if they're changing their symbionts. Um, could be one symbiont is good in this location and they change them at a different location which is, which is more beneficial to them or, or vice versa. So there's a lot more maybe minute scale things that we aren't capturing in our data collection. Um, maybe something at the site is affects that genotype um, in terms of an algae or uh, something else that really affects that genotype, then the other ones have the ability to fight off that um, in terms of disease as well. Kind of like the flu, you know, we can, certain people can fight it off, certain people can't one year, and then the next year, that person may get it next year not, because there are different strains of them. So my second question is, do you have these work published somewhere? Working on them. Okay. Yep, yep. Did you have a question, Seth? Uh, I want to wait. It's not short. Okay. <laughs> Is anybody doing a quantitative genetic analysis on this data? Because both in your presentation and some of the questions, folks are dancing around the edge of questions that are easily addressed using quantitative genetics. And since you know genotypes, and you've got clone fragments <coughs> out there, that's usually the most difficult part is figuring out who the parents are. But you'll have that. And so then you can figure out, for example, how much of the influence on survival or growth or whatever you want to look at it is under the influence of genetics, how much is due to the environment, and then what's really probably <coughs> important is how much is due to plasticity, mm -hmm. the interaction between the two. And I know that. In marine biology in general, and probably coral work in specifics, there's not much training or attention to being quantitative genetics, and that's a field that's advanced and yeah. husbandry to the point where you can support eight, nine billion people on this planet. There, there are people looking at to some level. I don't know if Steph can also with, with forge work and, and others. There are people looking into um, forgery. who just graduated uh, from UM. And I know Eliana's looking into stuff. Um, uh, Stephen Bomer is looking into stuff. Uh, but I'm not sure at what level. I, I'm not a geneticist, so I can't answer like, what level those are. But I don't stuff can you answer anymore? Um, with with Ford's work, um, he, he, was, he basically did home garden reciprocal transplants and followed 10 genotypes at six sites. Um, looked at what they were doing in the nursery, looked at what they were doing in um, all of the alpine sites, looked at bleaching susceptibility, looked at recovery, looked at you know lots of different, and then you know ran the genetics on them along the way. Um, and basically, it's um, more of a <coughs> effect than a genotypic effect. Although there are genotypic effects, like there's definitely you'll always have a slow grower or a fast grower, but sometimes they'll grow fast in the nursery, slower in an alpine site, slow in the nursery, you know? So it's, um, they, like Liz said, there are people that are starting to look at that, but it's such a complicated question that to get, you know, to absolutely eliminate one versus the other, you know, whether it's site or, or genotype, it's, we're, we're getting there. I think people are starting. Those but methods are extremely well known and been well known since I was in graduate school. I mean, I'm looking at this data set and I'm thinking if I had this in Excel, I'd get those answers to you by the end of the day. It's well, a matter of uh, doing the analysis. It's not hard. This is really well known. Are you here tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I read it for it. really easy stuff. Because you know the genotypes, you've got the responses, you know the environments, it's just good at the analysis. Don't have anything weird about it. Yeah, but you still have like the whole different thing and different side of this, which is what first, not just the genome, but it's also the epigenome. I'm sorry, I guess. Okay, so what I was saying that you still, in addition to the genome and the environment, you have another thing in here, which is not just the genotype of the coral. She was mentioning also the genotype of the symbiont that is going to be interacting with the coral at precise moment. So there's another layer of complexity there. 
And on top of everything else, there is like also the epigenetic modification in those corals that are going to somehow affect. But I think that the point is what you mentioned precisely about the plasticity, which is going to be like where like really the interest, at, at least for the case of restoration, is going to be. So I don't agree with you it's going to be so easy as to put it in a spreadsheet and then look at the component of the variance of the genome and the variance of the environment and then have an answer, right? But I, th I agree with you that that is something that has been probably not applied to the study of these organisms. At least, at least as much as it should have been. I, that, that is my opinion. Yeah, the complication would be the symbionts. But, um, and there's people, the UN has done some symbiont work as well, so they may have that data. And they have a couple of questions now on some of that work. But this there's probably work. ways to get the symbionts in the analysis. Yeah. That, that would be the only complication of the street. So um, at the time of the house planting the fragment, you have approximately a two-year investment in that fragment. That's right, you said you grow for two years before they're out planting? Um, in the nursery, yeah, we grow them about two years just because they're not of size. We want to keep the sure. stock in our nursery. So we allow them, they grow about 10 centimeters a year. So once they're of that size, we basically lock off the top, outplant that, and let that grow again. And you said that you've outplanted 5,500? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what a fragment is worth? Mm -hmm. like an outplanted fragment, how much does it worth? The calculations have been all over the place. Um, I believe our last one, based on the funding that we had and those numbers that we went through, was around $90. About $90? Mm -hmm. Is that well, what you guys had to other nursery? About 90 The and cost that is, to grow it and then out it. Like, right. worth is a completely and totally yes. different <laughs> yeah. sure. scenario. So that includes both costs. That includes our salaries of raising the, of raising the corals in the nursery, outplanting the corals onto the reef, and monitoring them for. Permit requires us to outplant them for, to monitor them for a year. Scientists sure. were going more frequently, but that was required maintenance. And so she, she touched on a really important point. I mean, the approximate average cost is we could we can make the case is roughly the same for each fragment, but the value varies because of their structure. Yep. So that your whole talk, I, I really enjoyed it. In my mind, I was reframing. Like in a day, I, I would love to just go through the whole thing and present it very differently as a business case. And I think then it would look very different. So I know this is a science audience, but it would take a pretty optimistic philanthropist to give you any money after that and talk. But I think that that's possible if you start by defining what success is. Because right now, I've always wondered how seriously I should take like these sorts of brief restoration efforts, and I know I'm not alone in that. And the viewpoints will be very divergent in that, but if we can create a common ground, by defining what we see as success and starting all our stories about this with that definition, then, and I propose, for example, that success should be de uh, defined as a density per square meter after five years or after some period. Uh, so if, if you have that, then you create, you create this situation whereby you can quantify what it would take to meet that goal. So you're either gonna need more money or you're gonna need to reduce the costs of each fragment. You're probably gonna need to do both. But if you do that, then you can present the business case and explain how much more money you need and how much more efficient you need to become to meet the goal. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen a study like that, and it's, it's not difficult to do something like that. So ambitious PhD students in the room, I think, like, pay attention for a moment because <coughs> I'm sure that there's a conservation biology paper in the story of this exercise defined in dollars and cents with a clearly set out goal so that people understand if we really value this, which many of us do, of course, um, what it would take to be successful, because otherwise these, these survivorship percentages, though variable, are so low that I'm just sort of left unsure what to do next and how to promote our need to continue the effort so the efficiency can improve and the structure can change. So the only other comment I want to have on that is that um, when you talked about optimal um, outplanting design, it followed slides that included only density in the outplanting method. 
So in other areas where I know this have worked, um, we can predict survivorship based on models that look at persistence likelihood based on past disturbance and projected future disturbance, as well as current spatial variation and anthropogenic stress. And I don't see that coming in, but if you do that, then you might find that your sites are equally poor in persistence likelihood when other sites might be far better. And I know that that's going to be the first low-cost way to increase the likelihood that you're successful is to determine the sites where survivorship is likely to be greatest. And that's going to involve how planting more sites and maybe even considering a different area than the areas near you. Yeah, and we're we're working on some of that. Um, we've had some uh, crop water restoration workshops, um, one in the end of last year, looking at how we can increase efficiency, how we can decrease costs by outplanting <coughs> me, to a number of sites throughout the region and then comparing that, not just in, this is just Broward. We're doing sure. this everywhere throughout the Keys. So it, it is, it's looking at those, those small environmental differences between, between the sites to really tease that out. Can we go to a site and say, this Great route, I think, um, or it's not going to be. But thank you for those comments. Anything else?